Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today, I want to preach a message that I know is difficult for some to accept, especially in hard economical times such as these. And yes, I realize that things are hard all over, but I believe God still expects us to preach messages such as these. Today, I'm starting a brand new three-part series entitled Tithing. And this first video, part one, is entitled The Knowledge Tree. Please stay with me and weigh what I have to say. I understand that many of you believe that tithing was an Old Testament obligation, and that's fine. But I want to show you that it's much, much more than just that. Once you understand what tithing really is, you'll see its significance. Now, please, would you turn with me to the usual tithe of Scripture, Malachi chapter 3. But it'll be with a twist. I really believe that if you just stay with me and listen, you'll rethink tithing. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 through 9. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. In this portion of scripture, God seems to be a little bit upset with his people. He is rebuking them for robbing him. Now, you, you have to understand that you can't be robbed of something that do not belong to you. If you're robbed, then the thing that is being robbed must be yours. Otherwise, you are a liar. And we know that God is not a liar. But someone will say, that's fine, Brother Kenny. But that was old covenant. That's the Old Testament. I, I, I understand your concern, but my question is, because it's the Old Testament, does that somehow mean that the thing that belonged to God and was being robbed by man no longer belongs to God? Has it somehow magically disappeared or is now somehow mysteriously no longer his? No, it still belongs to him. It still belongs to God. And therefore, you are still obligated to give it back because it belongs to God. But someone will insist, Brother Kenny, you have to understand that that was only in the law. I hear you, but I have to disagree with you. Giving back to God was before the law and after the law. The law merely put a price and a name to it. Matter of fact, it was from the very, very beginning. So let us back it on up and start from the very beginning and let us define what tithe is so that you can understand better what I'm trying to say. Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 2. I want to show you something that you probably never saw before. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, both of these trees were in the middle of the garden. The tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but... They were only allowed to eat from one of those trees, the tree of life. Okay, but what does that have to do with tithe, Brother Kenny? Let me define for you what tithe is by using this verse. Tithe is just the name that man has attached to it. And, but what tithe really is, is this. It is that which belongs to God. And I want to say that one more time. I want to say that again. The correct definition of tithe is that which belongs to God. But someone will say, 
No, you, you're wrong because God calls it tithe. Therefore, it's tithe. Well, that's true. God does call it tithe, but he also calls what the Israelites ate in the desert for 40 years manna. Now, the definition of manna is, what is it? Do you seriously believe that God named the food, what is it? No, that's ridiculous. He accepted the name that man gave it, period. End of conversation. It was like that from the very beginning. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Now, out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Adam named every one of the living creatures. God does not run a dictatorship. He wants a partnership. He wants us involved with him. He wants us to co-rule with him. Jesus, when questioned whether it was right or wrong to pay taxes to Caesar, this is what he said in Mark chapter 12, verse 17. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. And they marveled at him. Jesus declared himself that there are some things that belong to God and we have to bring them back. We have to give them back. We have to render to God what is God's. See, everything here, everything that God gives us is not just ours. Some of these things belong to God and we are to give them back to God. Now, offerings were from the very beginning, starting with Cain and Abel. What Cain and Abel brought was not actually tithe, but first fruits. It was first fruits offering. So actually, the first recorded person paying tithe that's recorded in, in scripture is Abram. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out wine, bread and wine. He was priest of God most high, and he blessed them and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Abram was met by the king of Salem, and he gave him, Abram gave the king of Salem, the tenth of the spoils he had just won in, in the war that he had with Sherer la Umar, the, the, and those kings that were aligned with him. Now, look at what the writer of the book of Hebrews said about Melchizedek, king of Salem, and about tithing. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 4 through 10. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, and those descendants of Levi who received priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithe from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. And this man, who does not have his descendant from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal man, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. The word tithe simply means a tenth. To make everything simple, God just puts a flat rate of 10%, and he called it tithe, and he established, which was established by Abraham. Now that we have a working definition of tithe, it means, I want to remind you, that which belongs to God. That which belongs to God. Now, let us go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. 
And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So Adam and Eve could eat from any tree that they chose that was in a garden. The tree of life was in the middle of the garden. And they were free to indulge from this tree. They could eat as much as they want. They could eat at will. They could, could, could eat whatever they wanted. But from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which was in the midst of the garden also, they were not allowed to eat. It was the tithe. It belonged to God. But how did you come to that conclusion, Brother Kenny? Well, look at Job chapter 12, verse 13. To God belong wisdom and power, counsel and understanding are his. Job said that wisdom or knowledge belongs to God. Therefore, it was not Adam and Eve's to take. It was God's to do with as he pleased. Now, look at what the serpent said. Genesis chapter 3, verse 4 through 5. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God said, Now that Adam has eaten that which that do not belong to him, he has become like one of us. And there were consequences to pay. Both Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, out of paradise, never ever to return again. At least not on this earth. You can't take what, of, what is not yours without consequences. And you surely cannot take that which belongs to God without dire consequences. Again, Brother Kenny, that was Old Testament. And again, I said, you're right. That is Old Testament. But look at what God said in Genesis, uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. He said, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. God said that He does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Therefore, God still expects you to give back what belongs to Him. He still expects you to, to, to obey His statutes, to obey His commandments. God does not change. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want you to notice, please, again, verse Malachi chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. God told his people to return to him. But how? By giving their, their full tithe, the whole tithe, God said. Bring the whole tithe and they're also their givings, their, their offerings. So please notice that it was not in tithes only. And it was not just in offerings only. I know some people believe that they give the, the, their tithe and they're not obligated to give another cent. Or they're just obligated to give an offering and no tithe or just a portion. It's the full tithe along with offerings. Both tithe and offerings God expects to be given back. Here's something else I want you to notice. God did not say, will a man steal from God? But rather, he said, will a man rob God? So I looked at the difference between steal and rob. And apparently, to steal focuses on the object or the thing that is being stolen. But watch this. Rob, to rob, focuses on the person being robbed. So what does that mean? It's not about the tithe. It's not about the money. God doesn't care about your money. His streets are paved of pure gold. 
He doesn't care about your money. He does not need your money. It's all about the relationship with him. God does not focus on your money because he doesn't need it. He wants your relationship. He focuses on your relationship because he's a God of relationships. So once Adam stole the tithe, that part which belongs to God, their relationship changed. According to our working definition, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil could be considered a type of tithe because knowledge and wisdom belongs to God. Therefore, it was God's. Here's the other thing that we don't consider these days. We're under the impression that all that we, we make, all that we have, all that we earn is ours and ours to, 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 to do with as we want. And everything belongs to us. But God is of a different opinion. He believes that a portion of that belongs to him. Look at, at the scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17 through 18. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have, given, have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. God said, it is not us, it is not our own power, nor is it our own might that have gotten us this wealth or has gained us this wealth. God is saying there is no such thing as a Christian self-made man or a Christian self-made millionaire. God claims that it is he who gives us the power or the ability to gain wealth. So God doesn't like it when we claim for ourselves that which he has helped us do or that which he has done for us or that which he has given us the power to achieve such as Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did. He bragged, is this not the great Babylon that I have built? And God sentenced him to seven years of hard labor in the field. His mind was taken from him. His hair and his nails grew long. And the dew soaked his back until he realized that God is the one whose power helped him achieve all of the greatness that he was enjoying. Therefore, God expects his share of the wealth. He expects his share of the praise. He expects him, himself to be recognized for what he do. So, anytime we big ourselves up and think that it's us and us alone, God is not pleased with that. For God has helped us to generate the wealth that he has given. And he expects us to give back the portion that belongs to him. So in closing, I just want to remind you that tithe is not just an outdated, antiquated Old Testament law. The tithe is what is that which belongs to God. And God expects you to give him that which belongs to him so that your relationship with him may blossom, may grow, may produce. So I want to ask you, do you have a relationship? Do you know Jesus? If you don't, you can. He has made it really, really easy for you. All you have to do is ask. If you would like to ask Jesus that you might have a relationship with him, here's how you do it. Repeat this prayer with me. Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me, Lord. Help me to live for you. Help me to believe in your truth. Thank you for dying on the cross for me, Jesus. Now I dedicate my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I suggest that you do now, get yourself a Bible. Either dust it off from the shelf or go out and buy yourself a Bible. And get a highlighter. Read your Bible every single day. Highlight those verses that are meaningful to you. Memorize those verses that when you're, when you're in trouble or when you're tempted, you can always recall these and say, Thus saith the Lord. Then I want you to 
find yourself a Bible-believing church. Not one of those progressive churches, but one of those Bible-believing churches that still believes in paying your tithes, giving contributions, still believes that the, the Word of God is powerful and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Believe that, that, that God still exists and that He's soon coming back to get us and that we have to live a right way. Find one of those churches. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Pay your tithe in that church. And when Jesus comes back, he will find you doing what it is that you should be doing. And he'll take you to be with him. That where he is, you shall be also for all eternity. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Kenny. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.